semester uh, professor here, and it is my enormous pleasure to welcome Francis Beinecke uh, to join us. Francis doesn't, as we were just talking about, does not have an SOM degree, but I feel that she does. She's been on our advisory board, and her father, of course, is one of the reasons that we exist at all. She has some pretty good degrees, however, other than the fact that she doesn't have ours, having uh, graduated from one of the early classes of uh, women being allowed into Yale College um, and out of the forestry school as well. I know there are some people in the room who are also forestry school uh, graduates. She has worked for many, many years since graduating at the NRDC, an organization that I know many of you uh, cherish, an organization that's been active not only in climate change, about which we'll talk today, but on wildlife and wild places preservation, on air pollution, on doing a range of different things to help us enforce the laws that we have and inform the legal on environmental area more generally. Frances has just stepped down uh, as the president of the NRDC, which she has in, uh, served in that position since 2006, and before that served as the executive director of the organization. She uh, has spoken in my classes before, and she's uh, really a, a treasure to not only Yale, uh, but to our country as we think about some of these very hard issues. Um, we're going to have a conversation ourselves for a bit of time, and then at, at some point I'm going to open it up to have you uh, folks join the conversation and ask Francis questions. We're here till about 12.45, so you'll have time to go to your classes and we can liberate uh, the room. So I'm going to start very generally, Francis. You know, many of us who care about climate change spend some days optimistic and other days just worried like hell. Uh, about welcome to the world about um, about how the world is going in this area and I, I guess I want to begin with the general question how much these days are you feeling a little optimistic in the prospects of our world really doing something Paris is coming there are, seem to be at least some ideas of making some headway in the climate control as opposed to feeling just word sick about everything we learn about how difficult the situation is. So um, thank you, Sharon. It's great to be here. Uh, climate is climate change is a is really a fundamentally moral issue for the planet. Um, it really underpins everything we do because it's how our energy is uh, uh, created and how we use it. And you know if you read the science, uh, you know, I think actually um, people who work in this area, the scientists are the most alarmed because they're working on it every day and the indicators are really uh, grim. They're very, very grim. The changes that are projected are just happening much more rapidly than uh, people originally imagined and therefore the urgency to act is really essential. Uh, I guess I, I'm, I'm fundamentally an optimist. I think if you work in this field, you just have to be because uh, you have to believe that there are solutions and work to find what they are and then work to get them implemented uh, across the board. I think in the issue of climate change, the recognition of the uh, urgency of this issue is very widely accepted, with a few exceptions, uh, such as one of the parties in the United States. But beyond that, uh, <laughs> if you go around the world, you know, you don't see that conflict. And, you know, you look at uh, the world leaders uh, coming together, 155 nations have already committed uh, their commitments, which are, I grant you, not adequate. But if you, it, to me, if you look in five or 10 year increments at how we are addressing the issue, you can be more optimistic than if you look kind of day to day, month to month. So I was at the Copenhagen conference in 2009 and it was discouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of conflict. There was a lot of north-south conflict. Um, there wasn't a coming together. The outcomes were fairly modest. It was all focused on the governments. Looking at uh, Paris next month or later this month and then the early part of December, 155 nations have come together and 
literally companies and sectors are falling all over themselves to make announcements and commitments. So, you know, as far as the recognition and the engagement in the issue, it's very, very significant. Um, is it enough? And are, will these commitments get realized? Who's really looking at implementation of them? How do you document that? How do you ensure they happen? There's a tremendous amount of work to be done on it. But, you know, I, I remain an optimist that the focus is there, the understanding of how complex and fundamental this issue is, and there are just more and more, you know, sectors, leaders, individuals engaged in trying to figure out what the answers are. So there's no doubt there are going to be very serious consequences from climate change that's unavoidable. And there's a lot of attention on adaptation and resilience. But mitigation is hugely important, too. And I think that we are beginning to make some progress. So um, we're a business school or a management school. Um, and uh, part of our founding vision was um, managing across the sectors. And so here we have a situation which we sure as heck are going to have to manage across all the sectors, for-profit, non-profit, government. But I want to focus a little bit on the corporate, uh, the corporate role. We see some companies, as you know, that are trying to do some things kind of ahead of the policy. A little bit of carbon pricing adopted by places like Disney and Microsoft. Um, I'm sure you don't think that's quite enough. How do you see the role of the corporation in pushing government, maybe? in responding to government, in doing things on their own? Where does, the, where does the corporation fit in to helping us solve this problem? Well, first of all, I think the corporate role is huge uh, because the, actually where uh, private dollars flow is going to be critical to this. The public sector is not going to have the wherewithal to address this problem fundamentally. So corporations have to be part of the solution. They have to make the investments. and. Um, be part of the leadership on this. Uh, in the United States, particularly, uh, corpora corporations have not pushed on the public policy side. They've sort of held back. Uh, in 2008 to 2010, there was a group of corporate leaders called the US Climate Action Partnership. It was about 20 corporate CEOs and about five NGO leaders. NRDC was part of it. And that group came together. And it was very impressive, I thought, because you know we had the head of uh, GE, Jeffrey Immelt, and mm. Dow, and DuPont, and Ford, and GM, and you know, it really was a very powerful business group. And, and as well as a number of the utilities, PG&E, Duke Energy, third largest uh, carbon emitter in the country. Uh, and we came up with the blueprint for climate action, which actually became the blueprint for the early legislation that passed the House in 2009, the Waxman-Markey Bill and uh, was the design for the uh, ACES bill in the Senate that did not pass. The reason those corporate leaders were involved is uh, there was a Democratic majority uh, in Congress and uh, a Democratic president, and they thought there would be legislation. So they wanted to be part of the design of what that legislation would be. After the legislation failed, and then Congress has changed fundamentally since then, you know. They're not engaged in this from a public policy standpoint. Uh, it's just not part of what they're doing. They are engaged in different aspects of energy policy, particularly you know, getting the production tax credit and the investment tax credits for renewables, because that affects, for some of them, their bottom line. But as far as being leaders in the public policy sector, they are not. Now, leading up to Paris, there are now a lot of um, business groups coming together and making commitments. And the White House has assembled a group so far of 81 leading companies, uh, which is the business pledge on climate. There will probably be a lot more, uh, I expect, before Paris, because I think people are lining up. Uh, and that's their own commitments, what they're going to do in their own business to reduce their energy footprint, to mm -hmm. invest in uh, clean energy, to have a more sustainable design in their business. And that's all great. I mean, I think that's really important. I think sustainability in the corporate sector has just exploded in the last decade. Um, but it's not enough. Fundamentally, we need public policy. And you know, I hope that we will find a point where they will re-engage uh, 
uh, in it. Um, but, you know, as, uh, I mean, it's, nobody, it's not a surprise to anybody in this room that there's really no prospect of legislation, I think, in the near term. Some people can see a pathway in 2017. I'm not one of those people. I think it's more like a 20 to 2020 to 2025 mm -hmm. time frame. So when that, I think what will happen is what happened with US CAP. When the United States gets to the point of actually having a serious discussion, business leaders will come in. So it's, uh, you know, it's interesting to think about what policy we might finally do if we did anything, when we do something, to be more optimistic. You know, most economists, from Greg Mankiw in the Republican side, you know, all the way to those of us on the left, are pretty uh, speaking in one voice about carbon pricing. So, Sharon. And I wondered, uh, right, so, are you singing in this chorus with us about carbon pricing? So I or, do have, you, I have a or do you think of it as a fairy tale? <laughs> so in around 2000, when I was here at Yale University, I was I remember distinctly a conversation that I had with President Rick Levin and Janet Yellen, who was then on the Yale Corporation. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they said, you know, we're talking about climate, how important it is. You know, this is 15 years ago. This has been a very long conversation that we've all been in. And they both said to me, you know, Francis, obviously the answer to this is the price on carbon. And I said, yeah, well, I'm sure that is the answer to this. But you tell me what the political strategy mm -hmm. is to actually get that adopted in this country, because I don't see it. And uh, I didn't see it in 2015, and it's hard to see, or 20, 2000, and I don't see it now. Yes, we have to have a price on carbon. I think that will happen. And it's beginning to happen in a variety of ways. You know, in the United States, California is a leader. Mm -hmm. They have a cap and trade program. They're going to have the whole western part of the United States connected to uh, the western Canadian provinces. We have the Reggie Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the north, Northeast, uh, the Clean Power Plan, which is the President's plan to address carbon in this country using the Clean Air Act, will result in cap and trade program, trading programs. The irony of ironies is that China is adopting its cap and trade program before the United States. As somebody, David Sandelow from the Department of Energy said the other night over at FES, we're exporting the solutions, but we're not adopting them ourselves, which is uh, unfortunate, but true. So, I mean, I think there will be a car carbon, whether it's a, a tax or a fee. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot see the United States Congress as we know it now putting in a cap and trade program, even though a lot of people think it's the most efficient way to do it. It's more complex. Uh, they could see if a fee as an easier strategy. Uh, and I, you know, I, I believe that will ultimately happen. I think it does need to happen. It's interesting. Um, there are a number of companies now calling for a carbon price in the Paris uh, climate discussions, mm -hmm. and uh, that's not going to happen. I mean, they're not going to set a price. There will be people, you know, calling on a price, um, and it's not a failure if Paris doesn't adopt a price because, again, I think that. What's happening is there are a lot of uh, mechanisms being put up in place in different places, and those will get linked, and over time, as they get adopted over a broader area, you know, in the end, the, at least in the United States, the federal government is going to be the last place to act. It's going to have happened in so many other places that, you know, getting it over the finish line uh, in the United States Congress will be a lot less of a lift than it would have been, you know, back in 2010 when we tried to do it. So let me go to China, which may be more, uh, curiously, uh, we might be more optimistic then about our own country in some ways. Uh, so we all read the paper the other day yeah. suggesting that um, the emissions from China are, have been vastly understated. And now we see they're uh, quite a bit higher than we thought they were. Um, should I feel, again, optimistic because there's been a fessing up? Or should I be a, a, my usual economist skeptic and think we haven't fessed up enough and it's so terrible even to hear what we've heard? Uh, I'm, I guess think? I'm with um, the latter part of that. I think, uh, guess what, it's a bigger problem than they were admitting to, whether it's even bigger than that, uh, I think it's hard to know. Um, but I don't think you need to know the number to understand how essential it is for 
China to make a commitment to advance clean energy, to make the investments, which they're actually making quickly. I think the China case is interesting. And if you look at China and the United States, there's a, there's a usually different circumstance, which is in the United States, carbon pollution is a huge issue because we are historically the largest emitter and there's a huge amount of carbon in the atmosphere that we have put there over the last 100 years. But we can't see it. And so it's not, it doesn't have, you know, to the average person, it just doesn't have the same compelling urgency to act uh, on something that you can't see. Whereas, you know, you go to China, air pollution is just a hugely, hugely important issue. It's an enormous health issue. The health legacy or liability that's being developed with the amount of pollution uh, in China is just extraordinary. And the amount of anger and uh, citizen uh, just concern about what they're being exposed to is very, very high. And there's, uh, I, I think that the uh, Chinese government definitely recognizes that this is a risk for them. It's a risk because they have so many unhappy citizens who are essentially being poisoned every day by the levels of pollution. You know, in the United States, we now have our um, particulate uh, PM 2.5, which is a, you know, I always thought it was a very technical term, but you know, you go to Beijing and everybody knows what PM 2.5 is. In the United mm -hmm. States, no one would know if you're not in the sector. But we brought our emission particulate levels down to 15 parts per million. And their numbers are, you know, above 150 parts per million. They can go up to 300 parts per million. I mean, the amount of exposure that people are getting day to day is just off the chart. So their action to address pollution, which will address carbon emissions, are one and the same. And, and I think the health driver is a lot more significant to them from a political standpoint than climate itself. But they'll be, you know, climate will be the beneficiary. And it actually, you know, it, it's very just interesting working on this issue over a, lot, a long period of time because in the environmental community, we have really examined how do you make this case? And, you know, I don't think we've made it that well. I mean, we have struggled with that because we understand it from a technical point of view and we understand it from a policy standpoint. But communicating it and communicating the urgency and trying to figure out how to connect with people has not been the thing that we're best at. And actually, there's a lot of work being done at Yale now on that very topic with Tony Lesserwitz and uh, Paul Lucier, each looking at it in a different way. But um, so, you know, it's very interesting. If you talk, and now I'm segueing mm -hmm. away from China to sure. America, but Please. that's where we are. So, you know, if you talk to the American public about climate, you know, you get kind of, yeah, we think it's important, yes, we should act, but people don't really know quite what to do. You talk to people about clean energy, about renewables, and the numbers are off the charts about enthusiasm for investing mm -hmm. in wind, solar, clean energy across the political spectrum. You know, on the right-hand side is kind of the libertarian view that I want to create my own energy. I don't want to be dependent on anybody. And, you know, on the left, it's more we want clean energy, we're going to solve the climate crisis. So, in a way, it doesn't matter. But if you can address clean energy and find out ways to bring in a broader public and make them enthusiasm, maybe you can, you know, get the changes uh, that you seek. Whereas climate here is a lot uh, a more political issue. The thing that has happened that I think is just so important is starting a year ago when uh, China and the U.S. came to an understanding where you know, the U.S. made its climate commitment and China made its uh, commitment to have 2030 as the peak of their uh, carbon emissions. Of course, that article yesterday was, what is the peak? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what the peak is. I think what usually, what NRDC's analysis, and in any case, we thought that they would peak actually, that they could have had a 2025 mm -hmm. commitment. And I do think that this pollution driver will move them more quickly mm -hmm. with an earlier peak than, uh, than otherwise. Because I don't think they can, uh, you know, I don't think the Chinese population is going to be satisfied with the 2030 peak with the emissions continuing to go up till then. I mean, how are they going to survive that? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting from an economics point of view that a large chunk of what 
of what's happening as China produces the pollution is they're producing goods for us. Oh yeah, we've exported our pollution. Yes, and I, I think yep. people don't quite recognize that. They think, what's the matter that Chinese are doing all this pollution? Okay, we're eating and drinking and using the products which embeds their pollution. That's uh, an interesting, uh, interesting kind of a problem. So I want to come to the, back to the question about how do we convince the public? Because I do think that's Maybe you can do it by getting people enamored with solar and wind, but I'm not sure we're going to do it all that way. And I think we can think of this problem as uh, sort of how do we deal with the fact that people have pretty high discount rates. And this is a business school. I mean, we know that people in general are not going to invest very much in something that generates benefits. It costs a dollar now and has benefits. 50 years in the future. We, you know, we know we've done the math. The benefit 50 years in the future is worth about a penny now. Um, this is where I didn't go to the business school, but exactly. okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you didn't even... The business school didn't exist when I was yeah. I just want to say that. It's not but, that I didn't want to go. Of course, we know, you know, a little more subtly that that logic doesn't quite work when what we're thinking about in the future is a catastrophe. But making salient to people and making them care about a catastrophe that's going to happen at some distance in the future, I think is so difficult. And I wondered whether NRDC spends some time on thinking about how do we make real to people well, sure. And this when people are going to naturally think about things like, oh, some smart person in 10 years will figure out a solution, so why should I worry about it now? Well, I think that, uh, so it, it's a really important question, and it's not a question that we've been that successful in addressing. I, I, as I said, you know, I think in the 90s, when we were looking at, um, you know, mostly at kind of computer programs of what's going to happen, we were projecting it as a long-term futures problem, and it wasn't compelling to mm -hmm. people. And so, first of all, we didn't know how to do that, and second of all, we were wrong. Mm. And I, I think that the, the you, you know, we, we just made a, and it wasn't, you know, intentional and we, we didn't really have enough information. But now people have been told it's a futures problem, so they don't want to mm. think about it, but it's a now problem. Yeah. And uh, how we actually communicate, and I don't think the environmental community is necessarily the best communicator in mm. this. I think that climate change is really a societal problem, and it requires you know, leaders across all sectors to be thinking about it and communicating it. So as long as we put it in an environmental box, we're not going to solve it. Because they think, oh, you know, those are, those are crazy environmentalists. That they're, you know, they're telling us these things. Well, one, we're not crazy. But two, you know, we don't represent the entire American public. So figuring out and working, and this is where a lot of the research has been, you know, how do people think about this issue? Who do they trust? You know, what frame do, do they think about it in? And then who can communicate that to them? So, you know, for example, Pope Francis coming to the United States, writing the encyclical. The encyclical is about our responsibility to the earth, but climate change is a huge part of it. I thought that was groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. I, and I mean, I just, to me, he, uh, and I'm not a Catholic and I'm not particularly religious, but he's a moral authority for the planet. And his telling people that they have a responsibility took it, to me, out of the environmental space. And, uh, and I think, you know, there, I mean, I look at, for example, Charleston, uh, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina just experienced about the worst weather that, you know, you could imagine, 12 inches of rain in a short period of time. The whole place is flooded. Norfolk, Virginia, major naval facility in the United States, sea level rise, is putting that whole facility at risk. So, you know, you just go to community after community across the country, California, the drought, people are struggling with very significant climatic changes. Having a conversation about that and what they do about it, rather than, you know, the environmental community is telling you the world's coming to an end, is a much more effective way, I think, of dealing with it. And, um, and so, you know, I think that that's beginning to happen. And, uh, and I guess I'm optimistic about that, that, um, that except at kind of the, the top kind of shrieking heads of the political party, you know, people 
in day-to-day -day lives are kind of looking at how is this affecting my city, my community, my state, what, are the, what is our responsibility to deal with it, how do we deal with it, um, and that that, again, sort of comes from the bottom up. Uh, you know, whereas before we sort of thought we can get a federal solution to this, I think actually it's going to happen a lot of different places, and then how does it all get fitted together? So I long wondered whether global warming was a bad Better. thing to oh. call it. Because when we first started worrying about it, the rich north, had images, and in fact, there were some economic models that talked about, well, we're all getting, it's going to get a little warmer, and that's going to be great for Canada and for, you know, Kansas and places of that sort, and it's just going to be bad for those southern places, which are all poor and not us anyway. And I think what you're observing is that we're beginning to reflect that it's going to be bad for us as well. But somehow the Pope would like us to recognize that if it's bad for other people, maybe that's bad too. Um, so do you have any, I mean, you know, I think it could be one of the, 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 the sort of pessimistic view, again, back to that model, is that one of the reasons people in the North are pe taking it more seriously is they're seeing that some of their own cities are getting bad weather, as opposed to caring more about the rest of the world and low lying low-lying islands. Well, you know, NRDC did some research a couple of years ago, and, uh, you know, it was sort of targeted at how do people look at these issues, and we have a membership, it's about a million people uh, kind of engaged in the NRDC family. And, you know, those people, me and people like me, basically have kind of an altruistic view. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing is we have the ability to have that view, so we're concerned about our immediate community, but we're concerned about the broader world. The fact is most people don't think that way, can't think that way. They think about their own family, their own community, and just can't get very far past that for a lot of reasons. Um, so actually acknowledging that and then figuring out how to make it more local and personal. I think one thing uh, that the Pope did, which I really applaud, and before him there's a group called the Elders that uh, you know, Jimmy Carter is part of, mm -hmm. and Kofi Annan, and Mary Robinson, and a number of people who, you know, have been world leaders in each in other sectors, who really highlighted, this is probably around 2000, the human equation of this. And again, you know, I think early days, the environmental community made it uh, an issue of energy, mm -hmm. and made it an issue of science, and didn't put kind of the human element into it. But fundamentally, climate change is going to have a huge impact on many, many, you know, hundreds of millions of people across the globe. Many at the, and this was the Pope's point, the poorest of the poor. And what's the responsibility to them? So I think humanizing this, that this isn't, you know, it's not just science, it's not how we produce energy. It's fundamentally what's going to happen to people and how do we mitigate those challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I thought the article, there was an article in the Times this week about the Arab Peninsula, what the heat levels are expected yes. to be, an already very hard, hot part of the planet. It, it won't, people will not be able to live there. NRDC did some work last year, or last couple of years, on heat preparedness in India and in Ahmedabad, where, you know, it's 120 degrees on a regular basis. And there are many cities in India that reach that level, you know, over the course of the year. And just how can people, you know, what, what s systems have to be in place to alert people to create, um, you know, mechanisms to get, to basically make sure that they're hydrated, to get them into shade, to take them, take workers, you know, off of the streets, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's, I, I personally, over the last few years, have just become much more focused on the human equation because I think, I think it, first of all, it's, it's fundamentally, it's at the center of this issue, but I think it also uh, communicates more effectively to a broader public. So, Francis, what do you, you sounded optimistic about Paris. Why and what do you, what, do, what in your fondest hopes would come out of it? You tell me it's not going to uh, be something as precise as carbon pricing or caps and trade. What do you what do you think will come out of Paris, and why do you think it's looking better than Copenhagen, which didn't look good at all? 
No. Um, so, uh, you know, I think going into Paris, you have to be realistic about what it is. It's a UN uh, enterprise where, which operates by consensus. I mean, it's a very complicated, uh, difficult structure to get a dramatic agreement in. But coming into Paris, and I think uh, Christiana Fuerez, who's the head of the UN FCC, part of the UN that's kind of put this together, has done really a brilliant job because she has literally, with her team, gone country to country to country to country. 155 countries, as I mentioned, have made their independent commitment on what they're going to do. So instead of Kyoto, which set a target for everybody to meet, this is sort of the opposite of that. It's saying, OK, country, you tell us what you can do. Mm -hmm. And then add it all up. OK, so adding it all up, and there's a group called Carbon Tractor, Tracker that's figuring out what it actually results in. It doesn't reach the UN agreement of keeping us within 2 degrees centigrade. Um, but actually, the, I think the recent numbers are that it's 2.75. <laughs> And you know it's all about acceleration. So if all these countries come together and they make this commitment, and all these companies and all these counties, you know, their Mayor Bloomberg has a whole group of C40 cities making commitments. Um, I think Schwarzenegger has another group of states. Jerry Brown has a group of regions. I mean, there there is just a huge amount of conversation uh, going on in the world where people are looking into their piece and figuring out what their commitment's going to be. And I, what to me, the, what's different about this is the range of engagement. You know, that it's not people lecturing to one sector or another. It's these sectors individually taking responsibility for what they're going to do. Now, what they're going to do is not what needs to be done. And, you know, every, and, you know, I think people going to Paris have to recognize this is where we are now. Like people are saying, it's not the path to Paris; it's the path through Paris. Because this is an ongoing conversation. You know, we're looking at trying to be, uh, you know, net zero emissions by 2080. This is 2015. This will get us, you know, 2020, 2025, and then we have to continue the acceleration. So one of the objectives in Paris is to figure, and I and I expect this to be in the language, to set high ambition and then have a regular kind of re-upping. So, you know, okay, this is what we're saying today. In 2020, five years from now, we're going to review again and take that one step further and one step further. And one of the things I think you have to recognize is we don't have the technology now to get ourselves to 2050. I mean, we just don't. And that's where innovation and research and development comes in and investment. You know, there has to be a lot of work towards identifying and then ramping up, accelerating the solutions. Because in the end, it's all about scale. And we don't, we're not at that scale now. But you know, there's still some you know, incredibly positive signs. I mean, what's happening in the renewable sector, the drop uh, of uh, the cost of solar, mm -hmm. the amount of solar in the United States that's come online. You know, the amount of solar, I think, worldwide is like five times what the IEA projected it would be by now. That's incredibly encouraging. And, you know, you just hope there's more and more and more of that. And, um, you know, to me, I mean, I, I think, one, there's broad base recognition. Two, there are a lot of commitments. And three, and this is the important part, and this is actually what you get to do as part of your careers going forward, you have to have resolve that you're going to continue to work at it. And so Paris is important because everybody focuses on it. But the really important thing is January and February after Paris that people don't lose track and that they keep on it and they really look at, okay, who made what commitment, who's holding them accountable, what's going to happen, you know, to make sure they implement it. The thing that I guess I'm most worried about is if you go back to um, 1992 and the Earth Summit in Rio, there was a, a you know, treaty on biodiversity and the climate and uh, forests. I think those were the three primary ones. You know, our con countries make a lot of commitments, and then there's a complete lack of accountability. We cannot let that happen this time. There has to be accountability. And I, you know, I think the severity of this issue and how fundamental it is, I think there will be accountability there. And that, that's, you know, where, again, there's, a, there's an accountability mechanism in the UN but that's where civil society comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's where 
everybody has to take responsibility to ensure that happens. So, you know, I've taught SOM and even some forestry students for many years, and the current crop of students seems They're so crop. very much aware of sustainability issues uh, across the board. Um, and it, it, it can't help but think that the enthusiasm that corporations have begun to have for this thing has something to do with the group of people they see as their potential employees and customers and the kinds of things they care about. In the NRDC, do you see that your membership is increasingly young? Have you done any surveys of how these this crew uh, differs from our crew, so to speak? Um, um, Francis? So I, I, I don't think NRDC's members are increasingly young. I hope they are. But generally, <laughs> they're not that young because they're mem you know, there's a whole history of that. But I think that the sector has a lot of young enthusiasm. And I think if you look at 350.org, which is you know, the kind of activist group on climate, mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a lot of uh, young engagement. I, you know, I think actually it's interesting. So I've seen just the sustainability sector in these companies explode. I remember going, you know, Fortune Magazine had this Fortune Green conference. I don't even know if mm -hmm. they still have it, but they had it and I went for many years. And in the beginning, um, you know, there were a bunch of entrepreneurs leading green companies, and then there were a few sustainability officers. And the last time I went, like the whole place was a sustainability officer from, I mean, every company mm -hmm. had a sustainability person, which I thought was really great. I mean, I, mean, I, I really see that the companies are taking these issues very seriously. I still think that um, it, it, you don't want to stick sustainability off off to yeah. the side in an office. It has to be integrated into the business plan. The CEO has to embrace it. The board has to embrace it. And you know, I don't know, because that isn't the field that I work in. I just don't know how much embedded it's become in the strategy of the company, mm -hmm. or if it's looked at as, you know, this is something we have to do, so we'll do it. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm interested actually in your view of that. What so, do you think? Well, so I was struck, uh, I'm on a, a corporate board, and well, we were meeting with ISS, which makes these recommendations to shareholders about whether they're going to vote for the board or not. And one of the things they said to us was, well, we like the fact that you have a sustainability report and a sustainability initiative. And I thought to myself, doesn't really? Everybody? Yeah. Well, A, doesn't everybody, but the fact that a shareholder watchdog group is looking at that mm -hmm. will make that much more salient to the corporate sector than anything else would. Oh, yeah, that's because now it's going to turn out maybe you're going to vote me down because I don't take this seriously enough. So I was very encouraged in, in that, how much that had infiltrated the real business part of business um, in, in quite a, a wonderful way. So I want to give people a little time um, to talk, but, but I thought we could take maybe a few minutes about career kinds of things as you, um, as you think about, you know, look at all of those, these eager people that I, I look at every day in my classes. Um, I think, honestly, wanting to make a difference in the world in this area. Where should they go? What should they do? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I've been asked that question a lot of times since I've come back to Yale this semester. And, um, you know, when I was here in the forestry school, there weren't that many options. Mm -hmm. You know, there was civil society and there was a little bit of government. They were the beginning to be, you know, environmental agencies in the states. But it was just like in the very early days. and. Uh, you know, there weren't that many options. Now, you know, I think that their options are really unlimited. And I actually think that for people in this sector, there are so many choices, it really depends on what your own interest is. So, you know, let's just say, finding the solutions to energy, being an entrepreneur, you know, trying to figure out, uh, and I'm on an advisory board at MIT where, you know, there are all these engineers thinking mm -hmm. they've got the energy solution. I hope they do. It's really exciting. Yeah. So I, you know, I think whether you're an entrepreneur or you go and try to shift a major corporation or you go into the energy sector where the entire utility model of the country is upended right now and nobody knows how that's going to end up, uh, it's, you can actually almost follow your own heart as to what aspect you're interested in and find an opportunity mm -hmm. there. 
And I think this is a field that's just going to grow. It's going to grow and grow and grow because it's absolutely central to how we survive as a human race on the planet. It's pretty fundamental. So every part, you know, every sector is going to have to wrestle with this. And so I wish I was you, starting over. But it's interesting because you stuck, you like me, stuck with the same place pretty much your whole career. We're you're lucky. not going to do that. We're I lucky. Think. I know, you're not going to do that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we lucky? Right, we picked well to start we with, picked I guess, well. we picked is the good very, way very well, of right. saying that. The only thing I say about careers, and I always say this because I think people get trained in a particular expertise, and Jaron, you'll probably agree with this, but you know, you go to work, you're working hard all the time. Who you work with is as important where, as where you work. Because, you know, what is really great is going into an office and enjoying the people you work with. And that's what kept me at NRDC for 40 years. These are the most talented people, so committed to what they're doing. It's just a pleasure to work on their behalf each and every day. And so I always say, who you work with, I think, is at least as important as where you work and what you work on. And you know, Francis, I know, and I'm, then I'm going to turn it over. I know we're talking about global warming today, but as you've been with NRDC, you've looked at other issues. This is not the only issue you. Lots of issues. Lots of great issues. What, what were some issues. of what were some of your most fun issues over the years? Oh, that's, fun! That's, uh, well, you know what's fun is actually um, solving a problem. Isn't it? Solving a problem. So you know, NRDC works on a lot of long-term problems, mm -hmm. uh, and climate change is you know kind of the quintessential long-term problem. So finding something tangible that you can actually secure mm -hmm. is very, very fun. So you know, we had a campaign. Uh, this is you know one of the great things. So. There's a lagoon in Baja, Mexico, called Laguna San Ignacio, where a third of the population of the gray whale uh, on the West Coast goes and has their babies. And um, this is actually a corporate campaign. Mitsubishi and the Mexican government had planned to build a huge uh, salt facility there, which actually would have had the same footprint of Washington, D.C. Very big. This is a very wild uh, natural area with uh, very small populations who largely depended on fishing. And so we, with the, Ameri uh, the IFA, International Fund for Animal Welfare, launched a campaign against Mitsubishi on this soft facility. And um, actually, uh, President Zadio, who's here, mm -hmm. head of what is yep. it, World Fellows yep. or something, he was the president Wonderful. of the Wonderful, wonderful time. guy. Right. So a lot of the campaign was sort of focused on him, too. And it was a 10-year campaign. and. Uh, and the point was to shine a spotlight on this. And this was a World uh, Heritage Site and a Biosphere Reserve, two international uh, mm. categories under UNESCO. And yet it was going to be an international uh, soft facility and, and with a, you know, a big port. And they'd have to import all these people to work there because et cetera, et cetera. So we had this campaign. And we won. And, uh, and I have gone to Laguna San Ignacio uh, <laughs> nine consecutive years since after we won. And here is a pristine lagoon where a third of the gray whale population comes. And you go out on a little boat, and these whales come right up to you. I mean, it's the most intimate experience you can have with the largest mammal in the world that you can imagine. So you know that is just a huge high. It's like, yeah. can we really do that? That's fantastic. There's a reason you so were I born. See, when I see President Zadio, I say, you know, the most important thing you did when you were president of Mexico was protect Laguna San Ignacio. Actually, he went there with his family. I think that had a huge impact. But um, so, you know, fundamentally, being able to see what you've done is fantastic, and that that always makes you. Feel and good. I think that does bring us back to global warming to create the face of the baby whale. Yeah. For people, when they think about global warming, is a huge challenge because. I think wildlife, especially big wildlife, does that for people. It in does. A way. I mean, it kind of yeah. you know, it, pulls it, We are people, and that's that's what. But that's turns you know that's on. true for a lot of people. But you know the human element, the health impacts, the vulnerability of their homes, the cost. You know there are there are lots of ways to look at it, and you have to look at them at all at all those ways. I think. So I'm going to open it up to the. Audience, um, it's going to be a little hard for me to see with the lights burning, but I'm going to start in the back because no one ever starts in the back. This oh, is thank the you, back. Sharon. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm a joint degree student, along with like half the people here, uh, between FES and SOS. See, you, you had the opportunity that I never had. 
Still can. Um. <laughs> <laughs> now, you were wondering what to do after NRDC, Francis. I can see you in my economics class next year. I don't think so. Um, a good and, idea. And uh, we, we have an email list. And, and recently, we were emailing an, an article um, by Josh Galpern, who teaches environmental law here at Yale. Um, okay. And he wrote about desperate environmentalists and how he felt like his students have become um, overly pragmatic and interested in things like corporate sustainability and sort of lost their ideology, uh, that maybe we've yielded too much ground um, to those who are against environmentalism. Uh, and I'm wondering, like, your thoughts on that. I mean, do you mm. think we've, uh, you know, we can't get cap and trade, which is like a conservative idea. We can't get that passed. And like, have we, have we given up too much? Should we be like pushing more and louder? So I, I, that's a really good question. And uh, you know, I look at the environmental community, there's a big spectrum. First of all, you have to have voice to make social change. So what 350.org does, I think, is absolutely essential. And uh, I don't think we would have had nearly the visibility of the issue here in the United States if we didn't have Bill McGibbon out there uh, being outraged each and every day. And I think that that's hugely important. I, I, I mean, he's a hero of mine. I think he's. Fantastic. Um, meanwhile, you got to find solutions, and so you know I think there is room for people across the uh, equation, you know, kind of across the spectrum, to figure out where their role of engagement is. Uh, I, you know, I mean, people are at FES and SOM. Hopefully, you guys are really looking into what are the solutions, and you're going to have the wherewithal to put those in place. Um, and you're less likely to be on the front lines as the voice, but you need that voice because essentially you're changing the entire energy sector. I mean, that's what we need, transformational change of the energy sector. So the only way to do that is to move away from fossil fuels that have the strongest political might in the country. I mean, when I was on the Oil Spill Commission, I basically came away thinking, you know, the oil industry owns government, both parties, I don't care. You know, that's just the reality. The only way to change that is with voice. And that requires people on the front lines really agitating. And, you know, if I go back to when I was in college, that's what happened with the Vietnam War era. Because people were on the front lines mm -hmm. screaming and yelling that, you know, we eventually got out of the war and things changed. And I think that's essential here, too. I, when we go to Paris, there'll be a lot of people screaming that this is not adequate, and they will be right. Um, but at the same time, there'll be people saying, you know, this is a huge step forward, and they'll be right, too. And you need both. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm also a joint degree between FES and SOM. And you briefly mentioned um, trade earlier. And you have to excuse me, because as I'm further away from the core, it's hard for me to think about dead weight loss and, and surplus. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm wondering, we continue to pass these, these trade agreements to look for trans Pacific partnership. And I'm wondering, can we, can we think about solutions of extending our environmental regs on our imports? And what, how, do we, how should we think about that? Is that a likely solution? And what would be the challenges with it? So you're asking if we should put our environmental regulations on imports that are coming in. And there's a lot of talk about if you put a price on carbon, that it would apply to that as well. Right. Um, and I think that's why people are saying we need a global price. So you know, you're not differentiating one. First of all, it's a global problem. And you're not differentiating you know, one part of the country or part of the world from another. Um, honestly, that is beyond. How that would actually work is beyond what I could imagine, but I'm hoping that's what you're all trying to figure out mightily. Um, I think that in the end, uh, we're going to have a lot of different systems. I actually don't see, just because of the way the world works, that we're going to design a global system to manage this. So I think it's going to come through a lot of different kinds of mechanisms. And trying to think through those mechanisms and how they intersect is going to be the challenge. I think your instinct is right, though, from an economics point of view, that if you have a cost here, global warming, associated with carbon production, and it's a global cost, then you should be imposing that 
global cost on uh, the production, regardless of where it is. And that is one of the tensions associated with trade across areas in which there is not a common uh, not a common price. Um, and I think there have been some people, I don't work in this area either, but there have been some economists being creative around how do you think about a tax if we don't have a global system? How do you think about imposing a tax as it comes in to make an even playing ground between those companies that are subject to the price because they domestically produce with those who produce internationally? Um, so I think you remembered your economics just fine. Right. In the front row now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, Andy. And thanks for your sharing, which is very inspiring. I have one comment and one question on behalf of my um, classmates from South Africa. He cannot come and ask me to raise the question. Um, I'm from China, and I agree that um, the health um, issue is a more compelling driving force than the um, concern for the environment protection for China. And uh, just to further to that point, for example, um, from the demographic perspective, um, China already slows down, and the South Africa um, could be the next emerging market. And also, they have a lot of um, vast um, resource of the natural resource, uh, reserve, like the fossil fuels. And uh, currently, the issue for them is that the prioritization before affordability and sustainability. For example, they have a lot of coal and they can use the coal to generate electricity at very reasonable and low price. But the current global arrangement asks them to stop. You cannot use the coal to generate electricity because it, it, it will pollute the whole environment. But for South Africa, they don't have such compelling air, um, air quality or the sea level issues. They don't feel the pressure to do that. And for them, for the general public, for the average people, um, it is more important to have um, the available electricity at the affordable price than the consideration of the environment protection. For example, recently the World Bank they approved two infrastructure um, projects in South Africa to build up the most advanced technology to generate electricity, but which is way too expensive for the general public. So I'd like to ask hmm. um, for him that what is your observation and your hmm. advice to solve this prioritization of the affordability and sustainability? Well, it's a really important question, and I think it's uh, absolutely on the table in Paris because uh, basically the developed world has created this problem, and yet every part of the world has to engage in it. So one of the things that has to happen is how do you get money flowing to the developing world to address that problem, to make it affordable, to figure out uh, how to equalize that issue Actually, South Africa is very aware, I think, of the threat of climate change um, because sea level rise is going to be a huge issue for them in their cities. And Durban is one of the cities that's actually most advanced in figuring out a strategy for resiliency, which I was interested in because I, I didn't really realize that. But from their point of view is why do we have to spend money on resiliency in Durban for a problem that's been created by the North? So. You know, the nations uh, in Copenhagen made a hundred billion dollar a year commitment to address to provide resources available to the developing world to kind of equalize these issues. Uh, first of all, it's not enough money, and secondly, it hasn't been uh, fully financed yet. So when people are saying a hundred billion dollars a year starting in 2020, everybody's saying, "Well, that's not nearly enough." That in the end, it's got to be trillions of dollars. And I think one of the fundamental debates in Paris is going to be how do you get capital flows both from the private and the public sector flowing to countries that have this inequality. And you know, it's not just South Africa. India is another example. 400 million people in India have no access to electricity. They are now predominantly using coal. I mean, coal will be used for you know, many years to come. And one of the things that I think has to happen in the R&D sector is to figure out whether carbon capture and sequestration is a viable strategy because coal's a cheap and abundant resource. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to address exactly the issue that you're raising. It's a very, very real issue. Uh, but climate change is as real, too. So how you bring these things mm -hmm. into some kind of um, agreed upon structure is absolutely central. And, uh, you know, it, it's not an easy answer. It is not an easy answer because People are entitled to the same amount of 
energy that the rest of the, the developed world's had for a long time. But how do we do that in the cleanest, most efficient way and figure out how to provide financing to countries that have not, don't have the ability to do that themselves? It's a, it's a great question. I don't have the answer. You guys will have the answer. <laughs> Over here. Hi. Um, my name's Lisa. I'm also a joint degree between FES and SOM. Um, there are a lot of us here. <laughs> um, I'm curious, because in one of our classes we're talking about kind of social marketing um, for social causes, so something like carpooling or encouraging um, smoking cessation. Change. Yeah, it's sort of behavioral change. And I know you mentioned um, 350.org is like a really crucial player in sort of the communication element, but I'm wondering what features of maybe large-scale or small-scale campaigns you would see as really effective in kind of pushing this message for behavioral change um, and what that might look like. So first of all, that is not, this is where we need President Salovey, <laughs> the, the behavioral change expert. Um, I, I actually think this is sort of a generational issue. I think that um, people my generation have certain habits they're unlikely to change. I think that as figuring out um, how people your age look at their own behavior differently. I mean, the, the example, I guess, that everybody uses is that um, you know, particularly uh, younger Americans are buying fewer cars. They're moving into cities. They're using Zipcar. Either, I was just listening, actually, on the radio coming up here uh, this morning that MIT is trying to figure out how to have, this is a, a, an incredible, you know, having a driverless car that kind of goes around all the time and just picks up and drops people off, picks up, so that nobody would have to have a car living in an urban area. I think technology and behavioral change go together. I don't think, I mean, I grew up when Jimmy Carter put on the sweater and told everybody to turn the thermostat down. And, uh, and now there are whole generations of people who never saw Jimmy Carter make that speech, but they still know the story and we're still, you know, kind of digging We're still out. all cold. We're still in cold. In my house. No, we're, <laughs> we're, yeah, that's because you don't have the most efficient system that you could possibly have with an electronic <laughs> thermostat that you could turn on and off depending on when you're in the house. But... Um, so I think technology and behavioral change go together because there will be ways, uh, you know, with all this smart technology to kind of make people function differently because it'll be easy to do it. And, you know, what the story about Jimmy Carter is you can't create something that makes people miserable. And, uh, you know, I mean, and actually a lot of NRDCs, no, I don't know a lot, but, you know, people say to me all the time, don't we have to sacrifice? <laughs> And um, maybe we do, but it's not compelling and you're not going to get a lot of people engaged. I mean, that is just not the way you're going to engage people. You've got to give people choices and the choices have to work. And that's where I think technology and innovation is going to be absolutely crucial. I, I mean, I think one of the really interesting things that I think is going to fundamentally change the country is, you know, more and more people are interested in walkable, livable cities. You know, suburbs, where I grew up in a suburb, you know, people are just less interested in living in that kind of an environment. They don't want to sit in congestion. They want to be able to walk out and go to a restaurant, and go to a store, and do whatever they need to do. And you know, our whole you know, kind of modern 50s and 60s era was built around these suburbs. And people just, you know, that's kind of losing traction as a future. So I think research into generational change and how younger generations look at issues might be adaptable and, and how you take advantage of that and incentivize it is sort of the answer. And where that is, I think, first and foremost, it'll probably be in transportation. We have time for a couple more questions uh, over here and then we'll do in the back. Yep. Uh, thank you. My name is Ben. I'm also a joint degree between <laughs> FES and SOM. Okay, everybody raise their hand. How many joint degrees? Ah, uh, good for you. I, I will say FES is our biggest joint degree program. Um, yeah, so the global climate change effort is traditionally divided between mitigation and adaptation, and only recently has adaptation sort of obtained equal footing. Uh, for example, with the Green Climate Fund, which has pledged to uh, support 50% adaptation projects and 50% mitigation. Um, a lot of people think that adaptation is sort of a band-aid, that it's ignoring the root cause, and that we need to focus on creating transformational change, whereas um, Right now, there's already a lot of salient impacts in many parts of the world from climate change. Uh, and mitigation is, uh, there's been more progress on that front, and it's easier to measure, whereas adaptation is a bit more nebulous, and how do you measure resilience? 
Um, do you think right now we're at the appropriate balance in terms of the focus and resources that we're allocating to each side, or should we even be viewing them as so siloed from each other? So first of all, there's not enough resources in either one. So no, are we at a resource? Not even close. Not not even in this, you know, not in the range of uh, what's essential. Absolutely not. Um, you guys probably read the Steve Coonan article yesterday in the New York Times. He did an op-ed, uh, which was all about, we've kind of lost the mitigation. We should all be about the adaptation. I was like, that is the gloomiest thing I ever read, because I don't believe that. I absolutely do not believe that. I think, and actually, so you're absolutely right. You know, for years, um, we basically did not want to address adaptation because we thought, well, that sort of gives up the game on mitigation. If we start talking about adaptation, you know, we've, we've you know, kind mm -hmm. of admitted failure. And uh, the fact is, change is happening very rapidly now. We have to address adaptation. And adaptation also, I think, gets to the human equation much more directly because people are being affected. And you know that's a way to kind of engage people uh, more directly, perhaps, than the energy policies of mitigation. So uh, do I think we're doing enough overall? No. And uh, you know, I think both need to be ramped up considerably. And I don't think it's a choice between one or the other. I think, uh, you know, this is where the all of the above works as opposed to all of the above developing fossil fuels. So I have one more question here in the back. Hi, my name is Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us. I just had my hand raised, so you know what that means by now, I think. <laughs> um, I'm a big believer in business. I think that's why I'm here. That's why a lot of us are here. But I'm saddened and frustrated by the behavior of some big unnamed oil companies, manufacturing companies, and more recently, a car company. Ah, let's um, so I'm wondering, you know, what, what do you think about the financial incentive that, that there exists to deceive? What do you think happened to corporate morality for some decision makers? And how can we deal with this stuff? Sometimes I feel a little powerless or small, even at this venerable institution. So, so how, can we, how can we fight the evil that we see? You know, uh, I wish I knew the answer to that. I mean, I have been so, I, you know, I said, it's hard for me to be shocked after working in this field for a long time, but I have to say that I am just undone by VW's actions. I cannot believe it. Uh, I'm like, you're the largest car company in the world and you're lying to your shareholders, your customers, your regulatory agencies. How's that even possible? And who could have made that decision? Um, I think accountability is absolutely pivotal. I don't trust uh, really any uh, promises without some transparent mechanism to find out whether uh, commitments are being adhered to or not. Uh, I think the regulatory structure that we've put in place is absolutely essential. Uh, and you know, I think people. I, I mean, I think a lot of things. I and actually, I'd love Sharon's view on this. Mm -hmm. But our system is set up. Uh, to measure things that don't work for long-term problems. So, you know, companies are held very accountable for their quarterly statements and their earnings. And, you know, the externalities of climate change and other issues are not in the design. And until we fundamentally change the design, it's not, it can't be their priority. I mean, I, I remember I was on, a, on this US CAP group, actually, we were trying to get these CEOs to, uh, actually it was not that, it was even earlier, President's Council on Sustainable development in the 90s, Clinton uh, era uh, initiative. And um, we were trying to get the CEOs in that to kind of embrace climate change as an important issue. And it was kind of, you know, then it was even less well, you know, pretty less well understood. But I remember we went down to Georgia Pacific because one of our meetings was in Atlanta. And uh, the head of Georgia Pacific was one of these people. And he kept saying, you know, this doesn't fit within my business design that I'm held accountable for. And to go to the conference room we were having the meeting, we walked down the you know kind of executive suite corridor, and there was the founder of the company who'd been there for, I don't know, like 40 years, and then all the other CEOs who'd been there for like, it seemed like an average of two years. You know, the, I mean, it was revolving CEO door. And that really had a huge impact on me because before that, I was sort of all altruism. Why don't you understand the morality of this issue and do something about it? And then when I saw all these portraits, I realized that's not what these guys are measured on. And until we change the measurement system, it is very difficult for them to incorporate the changes that we're seeking. 
And that's why, you know, getting policy changes, getting laws, getting regulations, they can't do it without that. It just doesn't work. And um, unfortunately, I mean, you know, as I said, both our political system, which works on either two or four year election cycles, and the business uh, reporting, which happens quarterly or annually, neither is designed for an incredibly complex long term issue like climate change. And we have to change that. And you know that will take time, but meanwhile, accountability is pivotal. So I think I'm going to end there. So I, since you invited me to comment too, I, I completely agree with that, and I do think we have to structure incentives in the right way for people. But you know, in the end too, there's a piece of me, economist though I am, that uh, is interested in the Pope, um, and thinks you know when we see things at VW, I think. None of my students would do that. Um, and I think we train young people who listen to each other and who listen to people like Francis and come away with some values about doing the honest, right thing, and that that, too, makes a difference. And again, I think listening to someone like Francis hopefully leaves you all thinking, I, too, would like to look at the whales and make a difference. Oh, yes, Please join me in thanking Francis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.